Good morning. Good morning. I have a couple of announcements as I welcome you here today. First of all, a reminder about the pumpkin patch is open, and you can see we've done a great job of selling pumpkins, and we have only a few more, and this should be the um, this should be the, the, the big week, right, I mean, for pumpkins. And so hope you'll come out and support that for the youth and the uh, children's funds. Also a reminder that next Sunday night at 5 o'clock we'll have our carnival, fall carnival, trunk and treat. It will begin in the Family Life Center with games and things for kids. Invite all the children you'd like to come and then we'll move outside for the trunk or treat. A uh, reminder that the United Methodist Women uh, has a meal that was postponed until this week at the, on the 20, uh, no, not this week, what week is it? The 28th, whenever, whatever week the 28th is in, <laughs> that's the, when the meal is postponed to the 28th. This is uh, Library Day. If there's any children here, I'd like to go with Miss Beth at the, end, at the usual time for the library. A reminder that tomorrow night <laughs> is our uh, charge conference, the administrative council uh, is the charge conference. We'll meet at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary with the district superintendent. Let's begin our worship.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. Lord, we come here today because we can, because you've created this amazing world, because you've given us days and nights to live by. You've given us minds to make decisions and understand with, and hearts to fill with, and because we're lucky enough to have the freedom to use these gifts. Amen. Let us affirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Maybe see, and if we have any children here today, would you come forward? And Mr. Raff, yeah, here comes a few. Has the time today?
Good morning. How are y'all? Two acolytes look like two angels sitting there. Um, y'all are pretty smart, aren't you? Aren't most of y'all in school? All of you in school? <clears throat> okay. Well, I got a couple of questions I want to ask you this morning. And uh, I want you to listen carefully. Now, here's the first question. If it takes 20 minutes to hard boil one egg, how long does it take to hard boil two eggs? 40? 40? No, I tricked you. It only takes 20 minutes, no matter how many eggs you got in there, right? Okay. Got another question for you. A farmer has 15 sheep, and all but nine of them die. How many sheep does he have left? <laughs> Nine is right. <clears throat> the answer, um, uh, or I told you that nine of them, uh, all but nine of them died. So I tricked some of you with those questions, didn't I? You had to really think about it. Well, have you ever tried to trick somebody or had somebody play a trick on you? Okay. Well, sometimes tricks can be fun, but sometimes they can be mean. And... Um, Sometimes when somebody plays one on you, they can get you in trouble, or they're trying to get you in trouble. Well, several places in the New Testament, there were people that tried to trick Jesus, and they would ask him questions um, so that he would get in trouble with one group or another, no matter how he answered the question. Um, the people in Jesus' day had to pay taxes to the Roman government just like your parents have to pay taxes to our government. And just like today, paying taxes was not very popular. And one day, a group of religious leaders came to Jesus and they asked him if he thought that the people should pay taxes. They were actually trying to trick him because no matter how Jesus answered the question, he would either make the people mad or he would make the Roman authorities mad. So Jesus was a pretty smart guy, though, wasn't he? And uh, he knew that they were trying to trick him, <clears throat> so he said a very wise thing. He said, <clears throat> he said, let me see a piece of money. And then he said, whose picture is on this money? And those people who were trying to trick him said, that, um, Caesar's picture is on there. Well, Caesar was the Roman ruler that all, everybody paid the taxes to. So then Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. I want you to um, look at this dollar bill and tell me whose picture's on there. George Washington. What does it say right above George Washington right up here? The United States of America. Well, <clears throat> just like Jesus, in Jesus' time, we also have to pay money uh, or use our money to pay taxes, <clears throat> whether we like it or not. But what about God? Jesus said, give to God what belongs to God. And the Bible says that we are created in God's image. Well, if that's true, then we must belong to God. And that means we have to give ourselves to God. He wants all of us, our bodies, our hearts, our souls. We're his children. Now, over the next several weeks in church, you'll hear a lot about giving our financial resources or money to God. And on November the 23rd, we'll celebrate what we call Consecration Sunday. And on that Sunday, everybody in the congregation, those who go to the early service and those who go to this service, will meet in this building and we will pledge for the coming year our financial resources. And we do that so that all the great things that happen here can continue. And I hope that you and your parents will talk about that in the coming weeks and then give what God calls you to. Okay, now since I started out by tricking you with those sneaky questions and because it's just a few days till Halloween, I suppose it's only fair to also treat you. So after we say a prayer, 
I have a bag back here and you can reach in there and get a handful of whatever happens to be there. Okay? Let's say a prayer. Father God, help us to give you what is yours, to spend our days in acts of kindness and obedience to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Scripture comes from Psalm 19, verses 1 through 14. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth their words to the ends of the world, and the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins, and may they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us bow our heads for prayer. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. O oh, merciful God, you sit enthroned above the earth and all are called to come and worship. We who have been redeemed and called in your family, we sing our praises this day. And because you are the creator and sustainer of the universe, all glory is due you. But we must confess that we fall short of the glory for which we were created. We constantly put you to the test. We're overly concerned with our own personal needs. We've not shown ourselves worthy. And we pray this day, O oh Lord, that you'd have mercy upon us, that you'd help us to regain our priorities, that you would remind us that we've been chosen for godly work, and that by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to be an example to others. And you would empower us to call people to acknowledge you as creator of all things in heaven and on earth. We are reminded this day of your abiding presence. We are reminded of your assurances that you have shown to us throughout the generations. And we know that you are merciful and that you care for us. And therefore we lift up to you this day, O oh God, all those who are in need. Uh, they may be in need of, in their spirits or their minds or their bodies. We pray, O oh God, that you'd give them what they need the most. Help us this day, O oh Lord, to understand, to call upon you with our needs. Help us to understand that we are called to be a compassionate and a receptive, a transformed people. Hear us this day, O oh God, because we come in your in the name of the Lord and for his sake. And we pray together with one voice, one spirit, as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue our worship with our giving. Let our ushers come forward.
You may be seated. Today, as I said last week, I'm beginning a sermon series where we're going to study the book of 1 Thessalonians. And we'll be doing that for the next two Sundays. Then we'll have All Saints Sunday uh, liturgy. And then we'll have two more Sundays. So to begin a study of the book, I think we should start in chapter 1, verse 1. And that's where I am. And in those days, the people writing would say their names first, like, I, Joseph, write this. So it goes this way. Paul, Silas, and Timothy are writing to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, love by God that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Acacia. And the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Acacia, but your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. And they tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank You for the preservation through the years, the centuries of the words to the various churches by our Apostle Paul and others. And we thank you, O Lord, that we can learn from studying that church what it faced and how it faced it and the characteristics and attributes that it had that we need to be successful, faithful disciples in our time. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Well, I read this poem the other day, and I have to share it with you. It was called The Perfect Ch Church, uh, thus the sermon title. It, will, it, went, it goes like this. If you should find the perfect church without one spot or sore, for goodness sake, don't join that church, for it won't be perfect anymore. If you should find the perfect church where all anxieties cease, then pass it by, lest you join it and mar the masterpiece. But since no perfect church exists with perfect women and men, let's stop looking for that church and start loving the church we're in. I think we could all say amen to that. What do you think? In our lesson today, we're going to see that the Thessalonian church, even though they received all this praise at the beginning of the letter of Paul to that church, they had lots of issues. They had lots of problems. Uh, just like every church I contend in human history. But they were also doing a lot of things right. And in our passage, Paul points out those things to start with. He says, I thank God for you. And he says, in effect, that this church was compassionate, very compassionate. If you, you think about the verses, you'll see that he says, we, we thank you for the work that you've done. It's produced by your faith, the labor prompted by love, your endurance inspired by hope. Paul praises them. Paul praises them because everything they, have, they did was motivated by faith, hope, and love. They were a faithful, loving, compassionate group of people now. Now, they weren't that way to begin with, but they were at the time he was writing this letter, even though there were other issues that he would bring out and talk about in the letter. For overall, this is the picture of the Thessalonian church that Paul had at the time. Well, maybe I'm a little biased 
But I kind of think that our congregations, early and late, are a little bit like that. I, I, like, I think that they, have, they are compassionate. If there's one thing I believe that our church is, it's compassionate. And it shows itself compassionate in the loving deeds that it does. And when we do that, we're exactly what the church is supposed to be. Uh, one of the things that we've asked the mission team this year to do was to compile a list of all the things that, in ways that we're in mission in our community and in our state and world. And it is and it's really hard to compile this like that because we're always constantly doing, doing things. You'll notice there, there was a thank you in there for an appeal that was made just at the early service uh, for, uh, for a project to provide clean water to people who didn't have clean water. You'll see that in your bulletin where there was a thank you for the money raised from a simple appeal. We are constantly uh, being compassionate, I believe, in our community. And in fact, our district superintendent will be here tomorrow uh, night to talk to us, of course, and to do the necessary business as we've done every year at Charge Conference. But he said he would hope that we could tell him, because he doesn't know our church, uh, how we're involved in missions. And so we've got several people who are going to talk about the many missions that we're involved in. We are a compassionate and loving congregation. And Paul has, it holds that up as the first attribute of this Thessalonian church. But Paul also commends them for some other things. He talks about them being a receptive church. He, he says that you, in spite of severe suffering, you still welcome the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. Uh, in other words, in spite of all that they'd gone through, they recognized this message was for them, and they accepted it with great happiness. You know, I know this because standing in line after church through the years at different churches, that Oftentimes people will come through the, the receiving line at the end of the service and they'll say, oh, we, we really like your sermon. Your sermon was great. And if old John was here today, he, he would have had his socks knocked off. Well, he really needs to hear that message. You know, let me tell you something. Instead of coming to church and wondering what it's, if it's what it's for, for who it's for, maybe it's for us. Okay? Maybe it's not for someone who isn't here. Uh, maybe the message from the Holy Spirit that day is for you and me. Uh, how does it affect our life? Am I receptive to the message that God has for me at this moment? Uh, you know, I often tell people that if I preach, say, a sermon and it's about faith amidst a lot of struggles, and then people might have some compliment, and I always say I'm preaching to myself. I'm preaching to myself. I'm going to go on a lot of struggles, and I'm preaching about faith to remind myself how important faith is. And, and so it's important for you to understand that the Holy Spirit takes these meager words of mine, often mispronounced and, mis and, and said out of context or, 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 or with poor grammar. It doesn't matter. He takes those words, and He uses them through you to affect the things that he wants to happen. And for, for us to, to be receptive to whatever the Word the Holy Spirit has for us when we come to church is very, very important. And so Paul upholds the fact that the Thessalonian church was very receptive to the message. Now, you know, really to appreciate uh, a study of, of these uh, churches, you've got to know a little bit of something about the church. I mean, for most of the time, most of us, we, Thessalonia, we, you know, half of us probably don't even know where Thessalonia is. You know, we don't know anything about the people who lived there at the time. But there's a couple things we do need to know. Now, Thessalonia was kind of an independent city in the Roman Empire. It was considered free, believe it or not, to govern themselves. Uh, they could do anything they wanted to do, except for one little thing. They had to worship the emperor. So once a year, they had to bow down and pay respects to Caesar. Not just tax, but they had to worship him. Now that might sound okay unless you're a Christian. Remember what it says in the Ten Commandments, you should have no other gods before you. Either Jesus Christ is Lord of all, or he's not Lord of anything. You can't serve two masters. The Thessalonian church 
put their necks on the line when they accepted the Christian faith. And Paul is telling them, I understand, I appreciate what you had to go through. I know that it wasn't an easy decision to become a Christian and to remain faithful. But you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And I respect you for that. You know, even today, we are suffering somewhat for our faith, even in this country. But the suffering going on outside this country is absolutely heartbreaking. Just recently, I was looking, I, one of the things I do to try to stay up on what's going on in the world, and with, especially within religious uh, circles, within the church, is I look at several different uh, news sources, and one of the th places I, I look and glance at the headlines is the Catholic news, news uh, agency. And recently I saw a headline where it said that communion had ceased in this town after 1,900 years. Now, now think about that a minute. Communion that had been given every week over a period of centuries in the Christian church in this community had ceased. Think about history. Think about all the times. Think about even during the Crusader times. This church survived and communion was given every week until this year when the little town was overrun by these ISIS or ISIL, whatever you want to call them, crazy terrorist people in a little town in northern Syria which had been Christian. And unfortunately within that news report there were pictures and I really was not prepared. I did not expect. But as I scrolled down through the news report there was a picture of a pile of little children who had been beheaded because their parents refused to renounce the name of Jesus Christ. And so they took their children and beheaded them. You and I need to pray every day for the Christians around the world that are being persecuted. They need our prayers. They need our support. It is not easy being a Christian today no matter where you live, but it is deadly in some parts of the world. God help us to be receptive to His Word in a world that isn't. God help us. The Thessalonian church was a compassionate church, a receptive church. And finally, it was evangelistic church. A church like that in the midst of a place that made and expected pagan worship. And yet, verse 8 says that the Lord's message rang out from them. The Lord's message rang out from them. The Greek word for rang out means to sound forth like a trumpet. They sounded forth like a trumpet in a godless land. That was the Thessalonian church. Those were the first Christians in that time. Here we are all these centuries later. Do we ring out like a trumpet in a godless world? You know, it's easy to share your faith. It's easy to share your faith inside the walls of our church. It's easy for me to stand here and share my faith with you. After all, it's safe here. It's my job. But being out there in the world, I know it's not easy. I find myself 
being more cautious, being restrained in what I say about my faith. And we live in America. I can't imagine the kind of faith people have that can ring out in a godless place. And yet this is a command of Jesus for us. Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel. We can't practice our Christianity and pretend that this verse is not in the Bible. If we're not doing all that we can to spread the love of Jesus Christ, then we're not being all that we ought to be as a church. I find myself incredibly blessed to have served you during these three years. I honestly can say that I believe that this group of people that I'm serving here now is the most compassionate and receptive group of people that I have ever pastored in front of. But we are weak on our evangelistic effort. We're weak. And we must, we need to find out and examine ourselves and see why is it that the Lord's message is not ringing out from my life. What am I doing to trumpet God's grace and love? What am I doing to reach out to people in my neighborhood? Because if we can't be evangelistic here and now in this time, in our place where we live, can you imagine what might be coming? Every church that Christ has established must be compassionate, must be receptive to the Holy Spirit's leading, and must be evangelistic. And they must be these things because they have been transformed. Not just transformed a little bit, but transformed completely. The Thessalonian church had been transformed, and it had a powerful testimony. The Thessalonian church, even amidst suffering, talked about the power and love of Jesus Christ and they turned away from idol worship and they served the living and true God. Paul says that the testimony of their faith rings out in the land. You know, it's, it's really important that we as Christians always come to the Lord first asking forgiveness. We must continually be in confessional mode. We are continually sinful. We must continually admit our imperfect nature. And we must come to the Lord every day, every morning, with asking for forgiveness. Turning our back completely on the sins and the old ways of doing things that want to entangle us so much. We must turn wholeheartedly to the Lord. That's what transformation is. That's the power that Jesus Christ has. And the church is made up of imperfect people. Of course, we're always going to be imperfect. We, we won't be perfect till we're translated into heaven, into glory. But until then, we can still be transformed. We are people who've been touched by the power and love of Jesus Christ. And we must remember what that means. We must constantly be compassionate. We must always be receptive. What's the Lord saying here and now to me? And we've got to be evangelistic. We have got to let our life shine in the world. And by those means, we will become transformed. And so then we will be on the road to being a more perfect church. A group of compassionate people. A group of receptive people. A group of evangelistic people. All who have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the first lesson that Paul gives us. At the, in, the, in his first letter to the Thessalonian church. I hope you will be eager to share this lesson with others you encounter this week.
Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn and smile at you this day. May the Lord give you His peace.